Okay, welcome back. Um, session one was about scoping out the landscape and really thinking about what diversity in the modern world is and what it means and what it should look like. Session two is all about the curriculum. What can we do that is more meaningful in our schools to raise awareness but to educate the young people who will be the leaders of tomorrow? We have got a brilliant lineup of speakers. I'm not going to build them up to put too much pressure on them, but four fantastic leaders who are working in different contexts to really do this meaningful, intentional work when it comes to the curriculum. We're going to hear from Benny Carver, a deputy head in a secondary school, Mark Pritchard, a head teacher in a grammar school, and I think recently an executive head teacher of a primary school too. We have Kate Smith, who is a co-head teacher in a primary school, and Serda Ferret, who is a co-CEO of Lufta, a fantastic digital platform. Um, just in that lineup themselves, modelling what a diverse panel looks like. So I'm going to hand over to Benny first of all, who is going to talk you through what it means to diversify a secondary curriculum. Over to you, Benny. OK, good morning, everyone. Um, it's quite hard to take five minutes to talk about overhauling uh, a whole secondary curriculum. So I really want to focus on pragmatic and realistic approaches to curriculum reform. Um, and what's underpinning all of this is uh, the desire to usualize diversity within our schools so that you don't get people who um, forget that uh, Arabic numerals are actual numbers um, and, and think of it as some sort of kind of foreign concept. So that actually one of the things that is uh, highlighted is the connectedness of our society to the rest of the world and to the history of the rest of the world. Um, and I use the term usualize thanks to Sue Sanders, who's been um, very much at the forefront of LGBT education. And she talks about the term in, in terms of um, making sure that uh, sexuality and different sexualities are usualized and not normalized because normalizing has those connotations of you know something that is the gold standard um, and as far as possible I want to talk today about avoiding victim narratives and I think sometimes in schools whether we like it or not the representation of um, other cultures of diverse cultures is through the lens of victimization so we look at famine in Africa we look at the holocaust but we don't necessarily Really celebrate um, the positive contributions and uh, the towering uh, achievements of some civilizations outside of white Western Europe um, for, for the simple fact is that we don't know enough about it. So first of all I want to talk really practically about subjects that are uh, lend themselves really well to the usualizing of diversity. So as an English teacher, I always start with English. And one of the great things that, that I've been able to work on with people is that the idea of first stories. Um, so we often start with, you know, Beowulf or Chaucer. We're actually we're looking at kind of fairy tale narratives that go uh, outside of white Western Europe and outside of a kind of Greek and Latin basis um, to be able to show students that storytelling is a universal concept and that civilizations pre-white Western Europe um, have this amazing contribution to make. Um, and I think the concept of first stories applies to history, it applies to science, it applies to art and technology as well. When you think about um, early feats of engineering, when you think about cave art, when you think about Aboriginal art, um, you really have that sense of first story. So my challenge is, where is the space in your curriculum to be able to include the concept of first story? for your subject. So where do we get that space? And one of the criticisms, or I suppose one of the blocking points that people often come up with is that we don't have space in our curriculum to do that. I'm not advocating a wholesale ripping up of the curriculum to uh, add in you know, stories that you know, you're unfamiliar with. I'm talking about looking at the content that you have and making positive connections. So where in your units of work have you the ability to say, well, actually, there's something running parallel to this or before this that makes uh, this particular bit of content particularly important globally, not just nationally, not just locally. Um, and talk about how those other cultures have influenced British society and literature. If you're doing World War One, well then talk about the positive contrib contribution of minority ethnic um, soldiers. 
for example. And the idea of connection is something that's very, very close to my to my heart in terms of language, in terms of culture. Um, I don't think our students see other cultures as connected to them. So I think that quite often when you've got quite monocultural classrooms, it feels like talking about diversity is a bolt on. And really what we need to shift that message so that we're talking about um, diversity as a contributor to the British story. Um, and not just in terms of, you know, we were in the war, but actually our language, our art, all is influenced by uh, global culture. Um, and this comes on to my second area. So not just talking about that pragmatic and realistic approach, it's really talking about um, teacher CPD. So SLTs out there, I challenge you to give your teams, your teachers space to have a look at their curriculum and get them to work out what's missing and where they can make those connections. The biggest gift you can give to you your teachers is time. So dedicate your inset days to um, that subject specific knowledge that falls outside of a white Western culture. Um, and the starting point is always reading texts the, that talk about anti-racism um, and highlight what systemic oppression is. So on a personal front, a teacher can take responsibility um, for their own education and say, I'm going to read about this. And then when I have the discussions about curriculum, I can make a positive contribution uh, to that. And certainly it's not an easy process. It's not a short process. It is very much a process that takes time and it, it takes people making the commitment to to learning outside of their comfort zone. And I love the idea that teachers could be sitting in their team meetings talking about, you know, well, we're studying Beowulf, but what can we add into this unit that's going to create kind of cultural connections? Yes, we're studying migration. Well, what stories do we have to tell to be able to usualize the idea of migration across the globe? Um, and that would be my advice. And, and certainly I'm looking forward to supporting people to, to do that. Brilliant, thank you, Benny. And what I'm seeing in the comments is lots of people checking themselves on the words you modelled there, usualise rather than normalise. Can I ask you to speak to that word choice for a second? Because there's lots of questions on Twitter. Am I muted? <laughs> We can hear it. Okay, right. Fantastic. So the term is very much about um, making sure that it's not just a bolt on, that diversity, diversity isn't just a bolt on to your curriculum, that it's actually a fundamental part of what we teach so that it becomes part of the daily diet of, of student experience and knowledge so that you don't learn about other cultures through the lens of kind of exceptionalism. You learn it through daily interactions um, with, you know, Black or Asian people, but I'm not just talking here about race either. I think in terms of disability and sexuality, certainly there's space for our curriculum to look at that as well, to usualize those experiences so that people aren't afraid of what's different. Brilliant. Thank you for um, qualifying that statement because I think it's, it's a word, word choice level. It's really, really important. I shared a brilliant piece this morning from a geographer who'd done a whole piece around firsts first stories in geography but she did do a warning to say please don't just print these out and stick them on the wall because that's not meaningful diversity in geography it's about how you embed it in the curriculum plan so thank you for kicking us off there benny really really thought provoking and i'm going to hand over to mark who's going to think about his context and how to take it up to the older students over to you mark thanks hannah thanks everyone um yeah so i'm mark pritchard hello everyone um i'm head teacher of upton core grammar school in slough and i actually want to talk about the 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 actual steps that the the previous panel talked about and benny's just talked about about the about growing that next generation who are well-rounded kind human beings and i think the that the, the keys are personal development and service to others um when I began as head, um, I was chatting to the head girl at the time, and who was um, a, a, who was Bane, and she told me that she'd never been to the theatre, and I was just dumbfounded at that fact. Um, she was academic, academically successful, she was intelligent, she was actually aspiring to be a doctor, and she'd spent seven years in secondary education without having been to, to see live theatre. So now I lead... A, as I said, I lead a grammar school, and it might not be what you, you imagine 
as a grammar school. 90% uh, of our students are BAME, 90% are Asian. We're in the highest EAL quintile. Um, the vast majority are from first and second generation um, immigrants uh, to the country. Yes, they're aspirational. Yes, they're great at maths. Um, but they also are kids from West London, from Hounslow, Hayes, um, Heathrow and Harlington. In many of our students' eyes, education is doing well in exams. Education is getting good grades. And it's also what education means to their families too. So I'm talking about diversity in the curriculum, not just about the academic content like Benny's just talked about, but giving students access and exposure to diverse experiences, real experiences um, that bring about personal growth and prepare them to be active and engaged citizens in our diverse society. So I think um, it starts with prioritising as a school leader. Um, we need to put it front and centre in our school's mission. And we, we said that. We said, yes, um, academic aspirations are important, but also personal development is as important. It's a leadership mantra. So anybody who visits our school, we talk to them about it. Any parent that's interested in coming, we say that, yes, um, you'll learn the academic content, but you also have to do um, so much more. Alongside the core academic curriculum, we've developed a strand, another strand to our curriculum. And we started with that starting point. So what should children experience? Um, should everyone see live theatre, for example? And we built it from there. So we called it our Ad Astra curriculum. Ad Astra was the, is the school motto. It's been the school motto for over 100 years. Um, so we took that to the stars. And it means that excelling in maths um, will only take you so far. And I wanted to have a, we, I was asked to talk with a bit of a post-16 um, sort of um, angle. And I know that every leader of post-16, every head of sixth form knows that uh, for university or for quality destinations, grades are not enough. Employers tell us this. In fact, we all know this. I mean, I, I'm sure that you don't remember the grade you got in biology or even particularly the lesson on cell division that you did. But you will remember the things that you experienced, like the trip to France or being part of the school musical. Um, but as and so educators know it and we know that personal development's the holy grail, but it's often sacrificed at the altar of the academic. And so we also know that you can't start personal development in year 12 and hope that you're ready by UCAS deadline. And you cannot develop resilience and leadership by reading an article or attending an assembly. You have to learn resilience and leadership by writing the article and by delivering the assembly. So what did we do? Practical things. So we built a curriculum to try and reflect those values starting not in sixth form, but in year seven, and going all the way through key stage four and five. The first thing that we did was try to broaden horizons. So um, built into the timetable is enrichment. So alongside maths and science and French, they'll also study music, but they'll do music for fun. They'll do yoga, they'll work on the school newspaper, they'll go to craft club, they do Duke of Edinburgh, they do Zumba all alongside their GCSEs. And it's uh, we, we consider it not as an add-on or a nice to have, but what education is at our school. Secondly, and actually most importantly, student agency and reflecting on personal development is built into our curriculum. So every student has to complete their own personal development activities. They, they choose what they do from volunteering to setting up and running a club to leading assemblies or hosting a school event. But then crucially, they have to reflect on the learning that they have, have, have gained through doing that activity. And that's the essential bit. So from being a subject ambassador or going to the theatre, it's recorded and tracked just like their maths homework. And by year 13, at the end of their time in school, students should have a bank of experiences that not only have they lived, but also that they've, um, that they've um, got a record of their reflections and the learning that they had at each stage. And the third thing, um, in addition, um, we don't just have a school council, but we have a school parliament with students who are given leadership and agency over the areas um, that they um, that uh, over the areas that affect them directly. So we have a, a department for education, a department for culture and sport, a department for education, and we give them choice, voice, and agency to affect what happens in our school. Leadership and development is is your fourth A level in our sixth form. 
So and what's the result of all of that? I think proactive students who own the curriculum, who own their learning and their growth. And, you know, we don't have students who are cajoled to go to extracurricular activities after school, like in, in some places and in some places I've worked. Um, in, in my school, lots of students set up the club themselves and run it themselves. Students' um, writing gets published. They plan cross-curricular fundraising events for local, regional and national charities that, that they are passionate about. Um, and students who actually hosted Di Diversity Ed, the Diversity Ed Conference in January of this year. Um, it was in our school and lots of you were there. So as leaders in our school, just to finish, I think leaders in our school, we need to prioritise diversity of experiences to develop young people um, to develop their self-esteem, their emotional intelligence, their self-confidence, but rooted in real experiences that grow not just knowledge, but also agency, values, leadership, and understanding. And I think this is how we will equip the next generation to disrupt the power imbalances that exist in our society and to really claim the world and the opportunities that should be theirs. Mark, so powerful. Choice, voice, agency. Three, three words we want to see in every generation. But I think that being future focused, we can, we can put plasters on all the problems in society right now, but we want to do things differently in schools to get a different outcome. And it's all about the young people we are shaping to be the leaders of the future. Thank you so much. That, that piece about the student agency really, really resonated with me. Global citizens. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Kate who is a primary school head teacher in a, in a very white part of the country. Um, and thinking about like, what can we do as white allies in white communities with white staff um, to talk about diversity, make it core curriculum as well. Over to you, Kate. Hi, thanks, Hannah. So I'll be outlining the work that we've done in our school to create um, what we would call the ethical curriculum and why that is particularly important for the context and the community that we serve. Um, but also the importance of all schools creating curriculums that are diverse and ethical and relevant, um, given the social, mental health and environmental challenges that we are all facing. Um, so a brief bit of context for you. I'm new to headship. I was appointed in um, July last year, so I have survived one year now. Um, I'm a co-head head teacher as well um, in, in a beautiful, beautiful um, part of Oxfordshire, very small primary school, just 106 children um, and four fabulous teachers. Uh, we were in quite an interesting position when we started the school and it had been through quite a, um, a period of upheaval. So um, there was no real curriculum, no real values, no real vision for the school. Um, and therefore we were in quite a unique position, which felt a little bit like um, uh, starting from scratch, uh, which coincidentally is what I did the year before when I was a co-deputy head teacher working um, in Aurea School in Didcot um, alongside Hannah, where she was the executive head teacher. Uh, so my current school now, and Aureus, um, just couldn't be more different. <laughs> my school is 97% uh, white, middle class children. Um, and just what was really apparent when I started was this complete lack of diversity, you know, lack of diverse representation in the school, within the staff, within the community, uh, in terms of race, in terms of religion, in terms of ethnicity. And it, it just felt very, very sheltered. Now, um, I have got a wonderful all-female staff, very powerful, uh, very ethically minded, but we are all white. Um, and therefore, I see it as my responsibility to create and deliver a curriculum that is diverse, that has a mindset that is diverse, um, where we are aware of our white privilege. Um, and that encourages the children to explore their own identities, but in a wider world. Um, and one of the questions that I pose to myself and my team and I would pose to you as an audience is how do you develop empathy and agency in your children when they have limited or no experience of diversity and the and the wider world? Uh, and, you know, when there's a lack of diversity in your school, it is far more challenging to use real, lived, authentic experiences um, that the children can learn from. You know, in, in ethically and socially diverse schools, you can draw on the children, you can draw on the community, um, you, you can learn from them. But, um, you know, you can ask them those questions about Ramadan, about race issues, about what it's like to have gay parents. And, and, and in the school that I work in, the children would use the term gay as an insult to each other. Um, they thought the word lesbian was a naughty word. Um, 
you know, the first time I did an assembly on the value of love, uh, I had an email from a parent afterwards asking, you know, if it's true that I mentioned lesbians um, in front of the children. Um, and she wanted me to let her know in future so that that could be discussed in a safe environment at home. But you know, that's that's a valid comment. But I remember vividly that the feedback that I gave to her, the response I gave to her was um, that we educate the children in school that things about about things that might not be part of your world, but they are part of my world and they are part of the world that your children will be growing up in. Um, so part of our vision for the school is that we are making a conscious effort to get in more LGBT plus representation, more BAME representation. Um, yes, through stories, yes, through books, yes, through visitors. Um, but also actually this year we've worked with the wonderful Anthony from Standing Ovation um, so that the children have got real life BAME role models. Uh, and I'm very mindful that I don't want this to be tokenistic. I'm very conscious that teaching an assembly on Black History Month is not enough. Adding a few LGBT plus books to my library is not enough. Um, you know, just celebrating pride in early years is not enough. The, the, the themes need to be embedded in the lessons, you know, in the attitudes of the, of the governors, in, in the hearts of the staff and the children. Um, and the wonderful Alison Creel reminded me earlier in the week, uh, this needs to be their usual diet. It needs to be the usual tapestry of the children's education because this is the usual tapestry of life. So um, practically what we've done in our school is identified five key themes uh, that, that sort of weave, interweave through the whole curriculum and permeate every subject area. Uh, and these themes are ethical citizenship, managing relationships, attitudes and skills for life, the inner curriculum and self-expression. So referring to my earlier question about developing empathy and agency in children with a, with a lack of experience, our curriculum plans and teaching have evolved around um, topics which help address the, the themes of injustice, uh, climate change, uh, challenging stereotypes, uh, inequality, just to name a few. Um, and an example of this is a, one of our earliest topics is um, entitled fairy tales versus modern life. So that gives the children a, an opportunity to challenge some, um, you know, quite delusive messages. <laughs> I don't want any four year olds growing up thinking that they need to be rescued by a white man on a horse. Um, you know, stereotypes start long, young. We know that, you know, pink and blue, long hair, short hair, girls toys, boys toys. Um, and, and the sooner we educate them, the more likely they are to be able to grow up and be, you know, strong in their thoughts and, you know, open minded and more reflective. And the same goes for educating children about environmental issues, and you know, and supporting mental health. These lessons should not just happen in PSHCE. They've got to be part of the school diet. You know, those five strands that we've developed, um, you know, they've been planned purposefully into the curriculum. And I think what's come to the forefront over the last fortnight's events is that actually it's not just enough to celebrate um, diversity. We've got to teach anti-racism. So my uh, takeaways for you then, uh, you've got to start with what you've already got and develop it. You've got to be creative. You've got to nurture your team. You've got to develop a team that are really passionate about teaching these issues. You know, they are the talent on the ground floor. They're the ones that are weaving the magic with the children. And no amount of beautiful planning uh, will help if you haven't got staff that are passionate about ethical issues. Secondly, you've got to educate yourself on your white privilege, you've got to check your bias. You've got to educate yourself on women's issues, on environmental issues. Don't rely on others to do that for you. Uh, and thirdly, ensure that your ethical themes are not just tokenistic. Question yourselves on how you can weave those into the wider curriculum. Um, thank you. Just to leave you with a quote then, uh, no one is born hating another person because of the color of their skin, their background or their religion. People must learn to hate, and if they can be taught to hate, they can be taught to love. And that is our job. Okay, brilliant, thank you. And I hope you don't mind me sharing. I know you were nervous as a white straight woman talking about diversity in the curriculum, but you've modeled this thing to everyone listening. Um, we've got a hater um, putting comments on, um, how can we got a diversity event? Four out of five of us are white. I just want to speak to that. 
In the Equalities Act, there are nine protected characteristics. I think between the five of us, we represent six of them. So yes, it's important to have racial diversity in representation. We have got racial diversity all day. We've also got cultural diversity, religious diversity, political diversity, sexuality diversity, and gender diversity. So challenge, but please go and read the Equalities Act, do some homework, there are no protected characteristics, and if we had a class, there'd actually be 10. Lecture over. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Serda, who's our final speaker, who's going to talk about digital storytelling and how to bring the world into your school when perhaps you haven't got that exposure to diversity. Thank you, Serda. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I'm actually going to start with a personal story. Um, and I love the word usualize. Thank you, Benny. Uh, in the past, we have said that with Lifter, we're trying to normalize diversity. Um, but more recently, we've been saying that we're trying to humanize diversity and diverse narratives. Um, and humanizing diverse narratives is, is what I'm going to start with. And this is a story about my dad. Um, my mum and dad are both teachers. They've, you know, they're retired now, but they were teachers my whole life. Um, and they've raised three sons who are all working in education. My dad has a moustache, um, and he's had one his whole, well, not his whole life, he's had one my whole life. I've only ever known my dad with a moustache. Uh, and I've seen photos of him from the early 70s where he's clean shaven and, and quite handsome. Um, uh, and I know that he grew his moustache in 1974. And 1974 was a significant year for Cyprus. There is a point to this story, by the way. 1974 is a, is a significant year for Cyprus, which is where my dad's from. Um, there was armed conflict, uh, which led to the division of the island. Um, and on the 20th of July, 1974, my dad was captured by Greek Cypriot soldiers and taken to a prisoner of war camp, uh, where he stayed for, where he was held for over three months. Um, and as I, as I was thinking about this, I guess that was his last lockdown experience. Um, and this was obviously a deeply unsettling experience and, and the scars remain with him today. And that's when he grew his moustache uh, and he hasn't shaved it off since. Um, a few years after that experience, he moved to England, uh, to London, where I was born and raised. Uh, and initially we lived in East London. Um, and back then we were one of very few immigrant families uh, that, that I was aware of. Um, and then in the 90s, we moved to North London, to an area that was home to lots of uh, Turkish and Greek Cypriot families. And for the first time, we were going to be exposed to Greek Cypriots. Uh, and we'd only ever heard stories about Greek Cypriots. Um, but my dad basically sat us down, um, and he's a very warm and empathetic man. Uh, and he, he basically said, you're going to make friends with Greek Cypriot kids. Like... Um, I want you to go to school. I want you to find Greek Cypriot children. I want you to befriend them. Uh, and being Cypriot, he didn't just stop at befriending them. He was like, you have to invite them to our house for dinner. Because um, that's obviously what you do when you're friends with people. Um, and he basically said, I, I want you to you know, understand that they are human. And I want your Greek Cypriot friends to see that you're human. Um, and I think that the, the only way we can do this is by nipping it in the bud and actively trying to make friends. Um, so based on this advice, my brothers and I all made friends with lots of Greek Cypriot kids. Um, and to this day, one of my very best friends, uh, Nikki, uh, is, is Greek Cypriot. Uh, she's one of the godmothers of my children. Uh, she's one of the only people I've seen outside my immediate family over uh, the lockdown period. Um, and I genuinely believe that this was a seed to what has become Lifter today. The idea that we can actually, if we give ourselves the, the chance to, to meet and humanize uh, people who we don't know that much about, we can find uh, this common ground. Um, so I should probably explain what Lifter is. Um, and, and Lifter basically is, it invites children into the lives of people from around the world. You literally have a window into the life of a human being, into their home or to their workplace. Uh, it's digital, so you can go in uh, into their world. Uh, you can explore it in 360 degrees. You can click on various things uh, to understand that context a bit better. 
And very importantly, you can always click on at least one human being in that space. And when you click on the human being, they come to life uh, and it becomes a short documentary film, a personal short documentary film about that person's, a slice of that person's life, um, where we touch on a number of different uh, themes and topics. Uh, and our, our idea is that, you know, the more people we meet, um, the more diversity we see through lived experiences, uh, the more usualized diversity will become. Um, and, and that is essentially what we're doing with Lifter. Um, we work with schools, uh, both well, we work with primary, secondary and special schools. We provide CPD, which has traditionally been funded and free. Um, I hope that will continue to be the case uh, going forward. So at the moment, if you're a state funded school, you can access this for free. Um, and um, yeah, we help teachers to, to try and bring powerful and immersive storytelling into the classroom in order to utilize diversity. That's me. Is that too short, Hannah? Shall I carry on? No, so that's absolutely amazing. Um, lots of people ask you to give a bit more details about the company, where to find you on Twitter, website, etc. Can you speak to that for a second, please? TA.com um, and on Twitter. Sorry? Am I muted? You were on mute. So if you could just start again, you were on okay. mute. So they didn't hear what you're saying. You can tell I work for a technology company. Can't you? Um, so it's uh, Lifter is L Y F T A. Uh, it's the Nordic word for lifting to lift. Uh, L Y F T A dot com. Um, on, on Twitter, we are Lifter Ed. So L Y F T A E D. Uh, and I'm Serdar Ferret. I'm not going to spell that for you, but you can maybe see it under my name. Um, and yeah, please reach out, ask any questions. We'll be very happy to help you. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, all of you. Such honestly, the comments are amazing. Such such powerful perspectives on the diversity needed in the curriculum and the ethics as well needed in the curriculum. And just from personal experience, when I worked with Benny at one school and Kate at another school, we brought Lufter in. We were in a very white part of the country. Our staff were diverse, but our community was not. And we did a, con a conscientious decision about our curriculum to to really give them a lens on the world. I didn't want our young people to just know what it was like to be in Oxfordshire. We wanted them to have an identity and belonging around the country, around Europe, around the world, and really sort of like have that wider perspective on life. Um, so I've got some questions to field at each of you now. I'm gonna basically just say your name, ask your question, unmute yourself before you start talking, please. Um, so Benny, there's lots of questions coming up about labels, and I'm taking us back to our very first Diverse Ed event. We did the keynote about, please don't tuck my labels in. Can you speak to the labels? But in particular, I know BAME as a label jars a lot of people. Would you mind speaking about the labels that we should and should be using, please, about race? It's a really tricky one because um, I imagine like with anything, it's really hard to get the world to agree on a particular name for something. Um, when you're talking about 7 billion people, you know, trying to pin down an accurate acronym uh, that talks about a, a group of them is going to be hard. And I think, again, to take a really pragmatic approach to this, BAME isn't perfect. And it certainly isn't, you know, the end point of what we call ourselves. Um, but it is what we have now and it's the most recognisable acronym that we have now um, and these things can't be forced you can't suddenly decide to call um, you know black Asian minority ethnic people uh, something completely different it takes time and a movement to do that and it takes you know the, the research and literature to do that so I think it's a little churlish to be honest to be criticising the label when there are things that are probably far more important uh, to be criticising um, the treatment of BAME people in fact um, you know whatever word we use let's focus on the real issues rather than the label itself um, there are lots of suggestions as to what it should be but like I said you know it takes a concerted group effort of millions of people to change a label. Um, and I'm looking forward to that happening, but it can't be a discussion for now. Thanks, Benny. And it's something I've consciously made myself change the language I use in the last few weeks. I've, I've done a lot of reading, and a lot of listening about inclusive allyship. And I know BAME as an acronym jars a lot of people. But when I say women of, women of colour, 
brown men, it also jars people because people think we shouldn't be using the colour of our skin to define someone. I think the advice I get from Jazz and Parfar is ask the person you're talking to and talking about how they like to self-define. And then we can have a conversation about the language we're happy using um, in our schools. So thank you for answering that question, Benny, brilliantly. I'm gonna go to Mark next. Mark, there's a real question coming up about this idea of disruptive leadership and how we can be disruptive as adults, but also as young people to challenge the system. Could you just speak a little bit more about kind of like what disruptive leadership looks like, please? Yeah, I mean, one of the um, the things about our leadership um, in our in our school and actually in our trust, we try to um, we we try to use a, a bit of a model to help people to to see through um, their actions. So one of the things that we know develops leaders who can work in complex and ambiguous circumstances is those real heat experiences and then being able to reflect on them and make sense of them. And it was it it, it sort of is exactly the same thing for the students that I was talking about, giving them real experiences that they then have time and space to make meaning from. And I think leadership needs that too. We need to see what are the issues, what are the challenges, and then come up with creative solutions that um, that we can um, that, that we can take on and hopefully um, make um, a, a big difference. But it does it does require, I think senior leadership teams to be really, really brave and say um, this is what is important this is we we trust us we do know what we're doing trust us um we we know that um this is important and and i always try to uh, avoid things like either or because um uh, you know that i i set up that dis, you know that disparity between sort of maths and um ex, you know personal development but personal development makes your maths better and you know we need we need to make sure that it's both and and it, they're not add-ons and it's, it, it's part of it um but um equally i do think that um there are um opportunities to give people um that disrupt that that disruption comes from also colliding perspectives and really getting those colliding perspectives you need to meet people who aren't like you so lift is one way of doing it and you can see that um but we need to get students both out of schools and we need to get other people into schools. Um, we need to make sure that they're, um, they're ha we're having the, the challenging conversations. Just now even, I mean, I we've put enrichment and personal development at the, at the heart of our curriculum, but al already in the last week, I've had parents saying to me, well, are you going to get rid of that stuff so we can catch up from the coronavirus lockdown and be able to just focus on math, science and, and, and English? Um, and disruptive leadership needs to be brave and say apps you know what is important what is education about and also what is really needed at this time um in this particular struggle and is it knowing how to do a quadratic equation or is it knowing how to you know really be emotionally intelligent and respectful to others who might be you know struggling as well so leaders need to be brave and um there's there's always going to be criticism from all sides but knowing knowing your values sticking to sticking to your guns um, keeping it simple and saying this is what we stand for um, and we're not good no, no matter what the cha changing circumstances no matter what the um whatever the the world throws at us whether it's a pandemic or whether it's you know um something else and it'll be something else soon um we, we, our values remain the same Thanks. Thanks. So, so much to think about there and so much resonates with me about being values led leaders, but being courageous values led leaders. We need to lead with our hearts. We need to lead with our values. And it's not always easy. I think what's coming up is there's a kind of a fear or an anxiety about putting our heads above the parapet. And what happens when we have meat resistance from our communities? What happens when we get that critique? Um, and I'm just going to ask Kate and Benny to speak to that because I think we've all been through it. So, so Kate, what are your what are your thoughts about doing the work that you believe in that you're committed to, but navigating the resistance perhaps from your staff body or from your parent body whilst you're doing that work? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, actually, currently, I don't experience any um, resistance from the staff, and I think that's really key. But because the school had been on such a um, journey before we started we had to build a lot of trust with the parents and that you know that takes a really long time plus we've got heads in the school which is you know that, that's not the norm so you know tr trust is the bottom issue and you know when I gave that example about the parent emailing in after the um, assembly about love you know that is a really valuable point because 
they haven't been used to leaders in the school that are prepared to address these issues that in my community may be perceived as being quite taboo. Um, but I've got to, we've got to, can't ignore that. You know, that, that was a valuable point. And actually for, you know, I had one email from one parent, as I explained earlier, and then I had another email from another parent that said, Mrs. Smith, I am really pleased that you shared that assembly. Um, the, the child in my school has got a gay uncle. And, and he won't talk about it and he hasn't told anyone before you know so then I could have a conversation to you know with that child individually to say you know my brother's gay should we talk about that should we talk about what it means tell me about your uncle you know that's really important and I think you know some of these issues are, <coughs> are sensitive but it's our responsibility you know and with the new RSE coming in uh, in, in September that's really important and I think consultation with parents at all times is key because that builds that trust and then you can be transparent about what you're trying to achieve when people understand why you're doing it and why it's important then they can get on the bus with you thank you kate you're talking my language there um i'm going to ask benny to add to that so benny um in our experience have we experienced any any resistance when it comes to diversity being at the heart of our school um, and then a follow-up question for you there's lots of questions around the sharing of personal narratives as staff and you know that my favorite moment working with you was the big assembly would you mind just talking to those two for me please yeah so um the big assembly that Hannah is talking about is, uh, I affectionately call my big gay assembly, um, which uh, was a decision I didn't make lightly. I've never stood up in front of uh, the school and uh, talked about my own experiences and my sexuality. Um, and I think certainly when people look at me as an Asian woman, they make assumptions about my sexuality um, that, you know, uh, entirely embedded in the culture that we have. Um, so when I did that assembly, I was petrified. Uh, knowing that our community that we were serving wasn't necessarily particularly supportive of, di of diverse voices and diverse narratives. Um, and one thing I realised very quickly is the children were absolutely fine. The children responded really, really well to that assembly. Um, there were some lovely comments from students about how proud they were of me for talking about it so openly. Um, and then I had that thought when well, they're going to go home and talk to their families about this and and what if tomorrow on the school gate I'm, I'm screamed at for for teaching their children about homosexuality um and that didn't happen I have to say it didn't happen in fact what I did get was um families who have um parents who are on the, on the LGBT spectrum um and you know I had people thanking me for talking to their children about it. So the fears I had with that were unfounded, but I'm really conscious that that's not going to be the experience for everybody. So I would never stand up and say, you know, come out to the whole school. It's a personal choice in the context that you have, um, but it can be really rewarding. When you know you've got the support of your leadership team and it takes a really courageous uh, head teacher, executive head teacher, governing body, who says, you know, actually we will support our staff and their experiences and we will use their experiences to teach our children about the broadest world, the, the broadest um, scope of the world that they live in. Um, that's no mean feat. And if you find yourself in a school that isn't doing that, then maybe ask some questions about why, why you're working there. Um, um, sometimes you can change people's minds and sometimes you can't. Um, but the fear is one thing, but you've got to know you've got the support from um, your employers. Um, unfortunately, Hannah, I did. So uh, it went really well. Thank you, Benny. And like that was my favourite adult assembly. My favourite child assembly was when our six young people in Year 7 our Student Council delivered an assembly about equality and spoke to the year group and told them that actually the assembly was about equity because equality isn't inclusive. 12 year olds get it guys there's no excuse for us as adults if they can use that language um two more questions before we go to another coffee break so sir there are lots of questions coming up about cpd opportunities when it comes to diversity can you just talk about lifter opportunities but also perhaps some of the british council work you're aware of as well please um so lifter is one of the possible cpd options on the 
British Council and DFID's Connecting Classrooms Through Global Learning program, uh, which is a fantastic program. Um, there are, so if you go to the CCGL website, you'll find a number of different uh, opportunities for CPD, uh, for funded CPD, and, and, and our course is one of those. And our course is called, um, it's called Teach Skills, Values and SDGs uh, with Lifter. And the SDGs are the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and it's, uh, it's a two-part CPD where we do two hours as a webinar first. It's great. Lockdown has helped us a bit because people now know what a webinar is. Um, there's no excuse not to know what a webinar is anymore. Um, so the first part is a two-hour webinar. Um, and actually, I really love our webinars. I, I think Kate's done one recently. Um, so I hope she can nod and agree that they're good. <laughs> Um, and then, we, uh, uh, and then, um, following the two-hour webinar, we give uh, participants so t and it's teachers from from uh, three phases. So teachers from primary, secondary, and special. Um, it's uh, teachers, teaching assistants, senior leaders, exec heads, CEOs. We've had everyone uh, uh, participating. Um, they get four weeks to try something with Lifter, and the minimum we expect is that they will at least plan a lesson or assembly. Uh, but ideally, they'll try it with children. Um, and then after that, we have a review session uh, where we talk about the impact that's been made. And, and that's always lovely and exciting because people come and share their impact stories with each other. And then at the uh, to conclude it, um, teachers get a certificate from the British Council. So that is our CPD. Um, and it's available for free if you'd like to take it at the moment. Brilliant, thank you. And um, there's lots of questions coming up about is this going to be available? Yes, we are recording this whole session and it will be on YouTube. Um, if you want to do one thing as CPD, play your staff body this video. Start the conversation. You could do uh, you could do four twilights and have the four the four sections of landscape and culture and curriculum and leadership as part of your staff CPD twilight, particularly if we're in lockdown and, and it's remote CPD. Um, and I'm very excited that this is going to be playing at the DfE. Um, and actually, we're going to have policymakers listening to this as well. Um, final question goes to Mark. So, Mark, you might not know the answer, but I'm sure you can think of an answer. Um, questions coming up about how we, as the as system, as school leaders, can challenge exam boards and subject associations to bring diversity into their work. I know there's a lot of petitions going around at the moment about the black curriculum, but it's more than just that. Can you speak to kind of like the, the, the advisory bodies, please? So... I think the first thing is, and I know so uh, there's an assumption there that it, some of the stuff isn't in the curriculum or isn't in the, um, the, the the specifications, and I'm sure that that is the case in lots of places. However, lots of things are subject leaders' choices. So in terms of things like texts and um, in terms of um, periods of history, there is, there is some scope to choose, and also the angles at which you approach them and teach them, there is, there is leadership scope. So I think, first of all, empowering our teams to make really empowered decisions. And I mean, for example, I know we haven't talked a lot about curriculum content, that wasn't going to be my focus, but my I'm really proud of our history curriculum. That I know that in year eight they 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 study the British Empire, they study it around the world and the impact it's, it's had on on people, including them, and they bring the students bring their personal stories um, to that. Um, and so I know I know that there are aspects of curricula that you can where you can focus on things that we think are important. In terms of exam boards, um, I think we, it's, we, we are, there's a duty for all of us, therefore, um, to get our voices heard. There are always consultations about um, what should be um, considered. There's a current live consultation about GCSEs and A-levels this for next academic year right now about what should be happening and and examined in those and as part of that consultation yes we're not going to say you know teach a whole swathe of other stuff that we haven't included but we can say um, and have our voices heard and say in future we need to make sure that there's breadth that there's variety and diversity is integrated and usualized as we've talked about in what students study and therefore value and I take that point completely. If we want students to to value it, sometimes they do have. They do, it does have to be qual a qualification. It does have to be accredited. Um, so th that's why those things are really important. I do also think that we need to. Um, it will always put pressure on governments. We can all um, have active links. Most head teachers have acti an active link with their MP. So I know my MP, Tandesi, and you know we must be telling our MPs that these things 
should be on the curriculum and we should be deciding it. Teaching bodies should be deciding, not central government and not um, you know, top, a top-down approach. And just sort of um, finally, I think, um, there is um, there are ways I think that um, in terms of coronavirus and other things that ha it has disrupted education. It has given us an in to start to reimagine what it might be, and I think this is the moment. I think it's the moment to to bring those different perspectives together um, from um, the you know the huge amount of um, press that. Um, is happening currently that um, we talked about in the, the last panel um, around um, you know the, the Black Lives Matter campaign etc as well as um, coronavirus making sure making people value education we now need to take the moment to say actually really is the content correct um, and can we make some brave decisions um, about what we teach and how we how we examine it So I'm just going to sum up with two words, visibility and voices. Who is visible in our schools? Please don't work in a school where your website is diverse, where your perspectives is diverse. But when you walk around the school, you only see white people on all the walls and straight people on all the walls. And then you have that token notice board for Black History Month. Please don't work in a school where when you sit in a science lesson, it's a white man after white man after white man on every slide. And not just the pictures we see, the thought leadership. Please don't work in a school where every single citation is from a white male theorist. We have all got eyes, we have all got ears, and we've all got mouths, and we need to use them. Thank you very much for tuning into our diversity session. 10 minute break, back at 11 to talk about school culture. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>